My name is Daniel, and I have been working as a cemetery caretaker at Bachelors Grove Cemetery for almost 10 years. It's not a job that many would seek out, but I like the quiet. There's something about the solitude of this place that I find almost therapeutic. Of course, except on Halloween, it's the worst night of the year for anyone in my position. Teenagers think it's fun to sneak in, play pranks, and record videos for their social media. I get it. People are morbid, and this cemetery has a reputation. The lady in white is not a new myth. Some tourists come asking for her, convinced they will see her if they walk the dirt roads after dark. I always wondered what made anyone believe in such nonsense. But well, I'm just the guy who makes sure the graves aren't vandalized and that no one is walking where they shouldn't be. That Halloween night was my second night as a cemetery caretaker. You could say I was still a rookie. I was prepared for another long shift. I wasn't going to let any group of brats ruin my day. The weather was perfect to scare off anyone who didn't belong here. Cold, dark, and a full moon that illuminated the cemetery and made me less dependent on the flashlight. As my shift began, the hours passed and all was quiet, which irritated me. The other guards had already warned me that the quiet was not normal for Halloween and they told me that if everything was quiet, it was because something bad was happening. I was expecting the laughter and distant screams of teenagers getting into trouble, but this time, nothing was happening. Maybe I was overreacting. It all seemed pretty normal, considering I was guarding a cemetery. But as I walked among the graves, I heard something that, at first, I thought my mind had made up. A baby crying. I stopped in my tracks. I looked around but saw no one. The sound came from the distance, sharp and clear. It took them long enough. At that moment, I knew it was a joke. I didn't let it scare me for a second. I wondered how they had done it. Maybe they had left a hidden phone playing the sound to waste my time. Kids today are pretty resourceful when they want to tease. However, as the crying continued, I felt a discomfort I couldn't shake. It was too real. The baby cry didn't seem altered, nor did it seem to be coming out of speakers. I followed the sound, walking faster now, annoyed, but also with a feeling I couldn't explain. When I reached the source of the crying, I saw it. A small bundle wrapped in blankets was placed on an old grave. It could not be real. I approached it slowly, not taking my eyes off the baby. A toy, I thought at first, but something about the way it moved made me uneasy. If someone left a baby as a joke, it was in very bad taste. I tried to get closer to get a better look when suddenly a woman in a white dress appeared out of nowhere and grabbed the baby. My first instinct was to scream. No more jokes. This is not funny. The woman did not respond. She walked slowly with the baby in her arms as if she didn't hear my words. I could barely see her face under the white veil that covered it. I'm going to call the police. You better end this now. You've had your damn fun. You're going to make a great YouTube video. She didn't stop. She turned behind a large ancient mausoleum, one I rarely visited. I quickened my pace, convinced I'd find her and could put an end to this. But when I turned the corner, she was gone, as if she had never been there. I froze, unable to process what had just happened. The baby had stopped crying too. The whole atmosphere started to get kind of stifling, as if the air had become heavier. That same sensation one might feel near a boiler or in a factory. I ran around the mausoleum and checked every corner, but there was no trace of her. Worst of all, I no longer believed it was a joke. What I had witnessed was too real to be a simple prank, and that scared me more than anything else. I decided to return to my post, but halfway there, the baby's cry came back. It was the same high-pitched sound that had brought me to that grave. This time, I hesitated to follow it. All my instincts told me not to. However, the possibility that a baby really was in danger got the better of me. I walked slowly following the sound, which led me back to the mausoleum where I had seen the woman disappear. The place was darker than usual. The flashlight barely illuminated, and the moonlight did not reach this place that seemed to be covered by the other mausoleums. The crying was now coming from inside. I approached the small broken window to look inside, hoping to see something that would explain all this to me. What I saw, or rather what I felt, was pure terror. Out of the darkness of the mausoleum came a hand, a rotting hand with hanging flesh and long fingernails. Before I could react, that hand grabbed my face with inhuman strength and began to pull me inside. The hole in the window was too small, but the demon holding me didn't seem to notice. It pushed 
and pulled at me with a force I had never felt before. My head was banging against the metal door of the mausoleum as the demon continued to pull me. The pain was unbearable. I tried to scream, but the hand covered my mouth and squeezed harder and harder. I felt the skin on my face tear, and the metallic taste of my own blood filled my mouth. I knew I wouldn't survive much longer if this continued. I hit the door so many times that I began to lose consciousness. My body gave out, and the demon finally let me go. I fell to the ground. It didn't hurt anymore, but that was bad. Faced with so many blows, I had to feel something. But I had been hit so hard that I was no longer on the verge of fainting. I couldn't move. I could barely breathe. But still conscious, I saw the door of the mausoleum slowly open. From the ground, my vision blurred. I watched as a figure in a white dress emerged from the mausoleum. Pale, barefoot legs walked toward me. And then everything went black. I woke up startled at my workstation. At first, I thought I was still in the mausoleum. But I soon noticed that I was in my little booth where I sat on my shift. Before I could react, I gave a terrible scream. A face was in front of me. As soon as I screamed, the face that was looking at me was also startled. Teenagers were in front of me, and they ran away as soon as I reacted. I got up with difficulty, still confused by what had happened. I checked my face with my hands, looking for wounds, but there was nothing. Not a mark. It had all been a damn dream. The most terrifying and real dream I had ever lived in my life. I shook my head trying to shake the feeling off and went out for another round. I walked aimlessly until I reached the mausoleum where I had dreamt that dream. I approached the door, and as if coming out of a trance, I saw the inscription of that mausoleum and remembered where I was standing. At that moment, I noticed something that I didn't understand how I could have forgotten. That tombstone had a name and a date on it, but what disturbed me the most was the picture on it. It was a woman, a woman with a white veil and a baby in her arms. It was the famous mausoleum of the woman in white. At that moment, I thought I heard a baby from inside. If only for a second, all I could do was turn around and leave. At that moment, I missed the teenagers. We have been doing urban explorations for our YouTube channel for quite some time. We would go into abandoned buildings, factories, hospitals, you name it. People loved to see us going into those places, defying the forbidden. We weren't superstitious idiots, we just wanted good views and some scares for the camera. The scarier the place, the more visitors. And that's when Trevor mentioned Bell's Cave. Bell's Cave was loaded with a very specific history. It wasn't just another forgotten place. About 200 years ago, the Bell family, one of the best known in the region, started having problems. Animals were turning up dead on the grounds, strange noises were being heard in the house, and family members began to fall ill. The worst part was when the youngest daughter, Betsy, began to suffer violent attacks from something they could never see. Some said it was a witch, others a spirit. In the end, the patriarch, John Bell, died, and many claimed it was the work of the Bell Witch. What no one could deny was that something horrible had happened in that place. Some versions said that the spirit or witch lived in a nearby cave where she had been hiding forever. There were rumors of people who had gone in, but no one had come out in a position to tell the tale. Of course, all that sounded like exaggerated legends. Typical stuff to scare tourists or keep children away. I don't believe that crap, and neither did Trevor or Luke. But if we filmed inside the famous cave, the video was going to blow up our channel. So, without giving it much more thought, we agreed to do it. Halloween was the perfect night. People would be entertained in their costumes, and we could work without being disturbed. Trevor got the gear, Luke brought his knife as usual, and I loaded the cameras. We parked near the woods and walked the rest of the way with our flashlights. The place was far away from everything. It wasn't a tourist attraction. The stories kept most away, and the few who came out of curiosity you never saw again. Finally, we arrived at the entrance to the cave. Nothing impressive, just a mouth in the rock. There was nothing special about it, 
No weird aura or whatever, just a cave. Let's make it quick and get out of here. I want to get home early. Once we got inside, Trevor was filming as we walked, narrating a bit for the video. Nothing we found was unusual or interesting. The cave extended a lot further than we thought it would, but the further we went, the more boring it all seemed to me. The video was going to need a lot of editing to make it more interesting. And then we heard it. A noise. It was subtle, barely audible, but just enough for the three of us to fall silent. We were all still listening. The sound came again, closer this time. It was like something scraping softly, like fingernails going over stone. I looked at Trevor, who was holding the camera, but he too looked confused. Careful, guys. It might be an animal. Trevor decided to shine the flashlight further. The beam of light caught something moving. At first, I thought it was a shadow, but it was not. It was a slender, hunched-over figure moving fast in the darkness. What the hell is that? Trevor also took a step back, and the thing disappeared back into the depths of the cave. Without thinking, we began to walk quickly out of the cave. It wasn't a complete escape, but we were no longer interested in exploring further. Something was there, and it wasn't an animal. It couldn't be. None of us said the word witch, but we thought about it. The sound continued, closer, more insistent. That thing wasn't attacking us head on, it was just following us, toying with us. It was moving fast, too fast, among the rocks disappearing before we could focus on it with the lights. Whatever it was, it was in no hurry. The next thing was chaos. Something lunged at Trevor, so fast I didn't have time to react. I saw him fall to the ground, screaming. Luke and I stepped back, helplessly. That thing had him. The light from Trevor's flashlight danced on the ground as he was dragged into the darkness. I couldn't quite see what had him, but I could hear it. Trevor's bones creaking, his flesh tearing. I didn't stay to watch anymore. Luke and I ran. The sound of Trevor's screams faded fast. In a matter of seconds, I heard another scream. It was Luke's. He was yelling my name behind me, but I ignored him and kept running. I didn't think about anything else. I just ran. Luke's screams cut off suddenly. Total silence. It was as if he had been shut down in one fell swoop. I didn't dare turn around. I didn't want to see what had happened to him. I knew that if I did, I wouldn't be able to keep running. But a new noise filled the space. A dry, crunching sound like a body being dragged along the ground. Something was moving toward me, and this time, it didn't bother to hide. Finally, the tunnel opened into a larger chamber. I was almost at the exit, and the noise behind me had stopped. I had lost it. I stopped for a moment to catch my breath. I couldn't take another step. But then, I saw her. There she was, standing there, waiting for me. It was huge. Humanoid, but barely recognizable as anything that had ever been human. Its skin was white, almost translucent. Its body was twisted at impossible angles as if someone had purposely deformed it. Its limbs were long and thin, too long for a human being. But the worst thing was the head. Large, bald, with two sunken, lifeless eyes, black as coal. The mouth was huge, hung open, with long, sharp teeth that seemed to not quite fit its jaw. It looked at me. It said nothing, made no sound. I could feel his hunger. At that moment, I felt like prey and nothing more than that. This was something real, something made to hunt and kill. If the legend was real and this was human at some point, that was long gone. Before I could react, it moved. It was incredibly fast for its size. It leaped at me, its mouth open, ready to rip my throat out. I grabbed a rock from the ground, the only weapon I had, and threw it with all my might. It didn't do much, but I hit her in the face hard enough to knock her back a few steps. I seized the moment and ran again. 
I could hear her behind me, moving fast, getting closer and closer. The exit of the cave was close. I could still hear her behind me, breathing heavily, almost smelling my fear. It was closer than I imagined. I knew that at any second, she would reach me. Suddenly, I felt her long, cold fingers on my shoulder, pulling me back. I fell face first to the ground, hitting my head against the rock. My vision blurred for a moment, but I could still hear her. Her breathing was deep and slow, as if savoring the moment. I turned my head and there she was, crouched over me. Her gaping mouth opened, closing in on my face. Desperate, I scrambled with all my might, kicking and thrashing. I managed to wrench myself from her grip by sheer instinct. I crawled as best I could toward the light coming through the mouth of the cave. I felt him right behind me, brushing against my heels, but I didn't stop. I don't know how I did it, but I got out. I escaped. Once I reached the light, the witch stopped chasing me. I stood up and ran to Trevor's truck without stopping or looking back. I started the engine and drove like a madman into town, my body shaking and my head spinning. Then I told the police everything. They never started a search and said that Trevor and Luke were probably lost, that it was an accident. The police knew something. I was sure, but they looked at me with faces like they weren't going to help me. They were faces that blamed us for having gone to that place in the first place, and that's when I realized what was going on in that town. Everyone knew that the legend of the witch was real, and we were not the first victims, nor would we be the last.